Hey everybody, you are at IGDA Twin Cities, and I don't have to talk over you anymore. This is terrific. Um, quite a few new faces, I think. I've uh, lost track of everybody a long time ago, so don't be offended if I don't remember your name ever, even if you've been coming here for a year. Um, so the plan tonight is to just real briefly recap uh, stuff from E3. I'd kind of asked uh, if people can keep in mind some of the stuff that we must talk about. Um, and we're only going to go for a half an hour, so maybe we'll start with the biggest stuff, uh, which in my mind is, what the heck is Nintendo doing? Let me see if I can find that page here. Come on. Closer, closer, closer. Yeah, there we go. Um, if you have or haven't seen it, uh, just just watch here and tell me what, what they're doing. Um, maybe we'll, we'll start with the, the canned stuff because I thought the, uh, the, the live announcements were especially confusing. A new controller and new console that was just announced at Nintendo's E3 presentation. And here is the new controller. Wow. I mean, essentially, it's a combination of a touchscreen, you have your traditional inputs, and you have motion control. But you have to see this actually in the experience. So the objective is really simple, Krista. All you have to do is run, and we're going to chase you. All right. It's like a giant game of tag. You're going to be using the new controller screen. You have that personal set of information. We yes. can't see what you're seeing. My job essentially is to be playing with the Wii Remote and these guys. We're going to be using the screen to try and chase you down. You can use whatever information that you have on the new controller screen to evade us. You can also use the left circle pad to go ahead and move around. Yes, we're on the other side. We can still see you. She's in the middle of blue, right? Okay. So try no, 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 no! Don't go! Don't go! Ah! Ah! I'm on her! I'm on her! I'm on her! No! I can't! I can't chase her down just yet. Miss! Oh, miss! Oh, oh yeah! Oh! Okay, so I see her. Watch this. She can't see me. She has no idea where I'm. I can see you. No, you can't. I have a map. in front of us like the entire time. Battle Me is a great example of how you can have two different experiences in the same game. Erica, Krista, you two are going to be using the television, looking at the television, and using the Wii Remote Nunchuck, and you're going to be on the ground. Of course, you guys have guns, so you want to shoot Tom. Tom, on the other hand, is going to be using the new controller with the motion sensing and the screen on it to fly the ship around and to shoot the two of you. Tom, it's on. Tom has just been seen. Good job, Erica. That was a good hit. Oh, oh, that was wrong. That was bait. You took the bait. So, JC, what are we going to do next? Interesting thing to note here is it's it's got the gyroscope inside, so you can oh no! Okay, keep going to places that aren't the TV screen. Oh, here we go. One. Oops, a little too far. 
throughout this week will continue to see the new console and new Oh no! It's okay, keep going. So there, there, there wasn't actually much more uh, that they did. Um, they showed some, some, some flashes of some proof of concept stuff and some of it uh, was even less compelling than that. <laughs> uh, I know it's Nintendo, I know that they don't know what they're doing, I just don't get it this time. Um, <laughs> exactly. But um, so, so some things to note, it's not a portable. Uh, it's basically a remote desktop. You need line of sight. Um, Roughly Bluetooth range, um, and I'm just curious if anybody wants to uh, take a stab at what they're doing. I've got a couple ideas, but uh, if anybody else wants to volunteer, yeah. Do we need a mic in, probably? Pass the mic. I think they feel somehow threatened by the iPad and its cheap games uh, that are really pushing into like their mobile market. So their solution is to somehow make a touch screen capable device even if it's not a mobile platform and you can't buy games for it. And they feel that moving into this territory is a good way to compete kind of by following instead of differentiating, differentiating their product in a different way. Anybody else want to take a step? This is fun. <laughs> As I finish my pizza. <laughs> so it's interesting that all the examples they showed um, were multiplayer. And in the end, and specifically where one player has more information than the other players, um, which, I mean, I'm sure we've all done first person shooters with screen washers and things like that. And it's a unique way to solve that problem while maintaining a very social environment. Um, <laughs> So the idea that video games are inherently social, um, but they can be social within a room. They don't need to be social like on a social network or anything like that. It's Online. going back to Nintendo's roots of within the same room, but you can still, it's a different way to approach the gameplay. So I think there's definitely positives to it. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how the gameplay actually is. Yeah. Did uh, anybody else besides me get that cable to put plug your uh, Game Boy Advance into your GameCube and play the one game? Anybody? Yeah. It was pretty fun. It, it's, uh, it was basically the, it was a Pac-Man game, so it was basically the hide and seek uh, with Pac-Man seeing the whole maze and the ghosts getting just a little corner of the TV. Did they show any demos of two of these things working at once? No. Yeah. Damien brought that up. Yeah. Uh, wireless wireless uh, video is, a, is a, a, a pain in the rear. Um, and it is, it isn't, dec you know, it's, it's streaming video. It's not, uh, it's remote desktop. It's not a GPU or anything else. They did play wireless in the press conference. They, they played what? Wireless. Yeah, they did. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anybody else want to weigh in? Actually, just for straight up gaming applications, like for RPGs, that would be great for inventory management. I think, I mean, that sounds kind of cheesy maybe, and that's very spec uh, you know, specific, but I think there's a lot that can be done to clear out the HUD on the main screen, and you can do so much managing there and do the same thing at the same time. Actually, I think it's kind of cool. Is that one of the shots they did for Zelda, showing the inventory all down on the Yeah, I saw that. I haven't seen any footage yet. It's a lot like the DS. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah the bottom half of the DS. And then the one thing I don't think anybody's mentioned, um, the scenario, it's uh, get off the dang TV, I'm watching my game, and then the kid <laughs> continues his Mario game on the couch. That was yeah. the first thing in the press conference. And the game after that led to that idea of right. all these games that you show where you chase after each other, you can. Any idea how much this thing is going to cost? Nope. Yeah, the, uh, no, no money, no specs. Um, the the CPU and GPU have been identified at a high level. It's very close to Xbox 360 um, power PC cores, AMD GPU, and then eDRAM uh, on the die, which is actually what gives the 360 all its horsepower. It's it's a kind of memory that's extremely fast and low latency, and very 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 expensive. So um, there's not even enough for a 1080p frame buffer on the 360. And backwards compatible, yep, and including the controllers, so you don't have to buy those again. 
So that is kind of interesting. That's they're giving up a lot of money there because those eighty dollar controllers add up pretty good. <laughs> well, unless they only can support one, I then you have to break it and buy one. I actually. Oh, my mic's on. <laughs> Sound guy doesn't always do it. Um, I saw something recently that said it only has one controller. You can't buy buy more. Okay. So. You break it. <laughs> new system. Your new console system. Yeah, and then and then there's like the dungeon master kind of scenario. Yeah, yeah, surprising people. <laughs> so, so the ironic thing with me is I'm I'm watching this on the DVR this morning, and I get an email from a friend of mine who says, "This is why you get an iPad 2 in a in a uh, Apple TV," and it was a blurb about a racing game that's going to come out that you play by holding your iPad 2 in your hands like a steering wheel and drive it on the steering wheel and then the game is actually, I can't remember the name, it's one of the new technology, what's that? HD, HD racing, but there's a new technology that it's going to allow you know, a, a computer and an iPad and a TV set to all talk at once for a real game, what's that? On play, on play I, yeah, something like that, yeah, it's something play or iPlay or something like that. On live, and and I gotta admit it looks pretty cool, but, but talk about you know talk about expensive game controllers. I mean, you know. But I thought it was pretty ironic that it looks just like what the was talking about the exact same time. Yeah. Do we do we miss? Uh, what is it? Oh, okay. Cool. And they've sort of implied that too, that since it's all a touch screen, they'll do controls right on it, kind of gesture controls and so on. There's that one uh, example of Othello. Yeah. Supposedly not, yeah, not out of the room. Yeah. Do we miss anything else from Nintendo that we should have covered or moving on? Whoops, whoops. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, since none of this stuff exists yet, uh, they just kind of said. Oh yeah, well we showed that footage from the PS3 and the Xbox because it'll look even better on ours, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, and that may be true, they just forgot to mention that. Um, and they, they have, what, probably about a year to actually make this hardware and convince us, so. It, it's, and Damien, you said something interesting about, about hardcore, uh, oh, yeah. but it's also hardcore games a year after everybody, the hardcore already played them and moved on, so that's, Maybe that's just what they're saying this year. Yeah, I think that you know, the, Wii obviously wants, uh, the Wii obviously wants a piece of that hardcore market, right? They've been targeted as the family console for 100 years, and no one will touch the console uh, with a hardcore mindset. And so I think by showing you know, games on current-gen consoles for their next-gen, uh, I think probably their hope is that they can reel in some of that market. Uh, but uh, I'm thinking, like, who that is hardcore is going to be, like, double fist in that uh, controller like that? You know, that just doesn't, like, I'm walking in on some 20-something dude playing Halo with that? I don't think so. 
just doesn't make sense. Yeah. They had a shot of a rack that they a gun rack and they stuck in it. Which, you know, that was like a little You know, the other thing, too, with the touchscreen is if they play it right, they can make a very customizable controls. So you could set up, like, a custom control for a game, which would be really cool for yeah, shooters, really, you know. <laughs> Maybe make some kind of... Well, they won't do macros, but... But uh, if you could do custom, custom tool sets for your own control setup, that'd be really cool. Unlimited is good. And thanks... Yet, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that in a very twitch-oriented game, you can't change your focal depth that often to look at a radar. Or a, so it's, it's definitely for slower kind of interactions. Yeah, they haven't really said. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have any any guts. It's just simply displaying uh, compressed video. Right. Is it? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen it up close. What's well, maybe uh, uh, anything else Nintendo that we missed? I mean, there there is plenty of other stuff. This is just kind of the like super super exciting. Let's see if I can get the song going again. This is a PlayStation PlayStation Vita. So I would say some of the, the key points here is um, it's obviously got more horsepower than a 3DS. It's got a higher res OLED screen, and they're going to sell it for $250. Um, and then they said exclusively at AT&T. And then the, the audience actually booed them. I recommend. Well, it's, I, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, uh, 3G. They booed. And, and then they got muted by the audio guy. Yeah. Um, I recommend you actually watch it. Uh, we, we didn't have time. Uh, I, I tried to queue up just the key parts, and it just wasn't working. But uh, it was kind of fun. And like I said, there's, there's touch on the back, um, which is kind of interesting because you don't have to block the screen. Although, I mean, arguably with the amount of controls they have on it, you don't have to block the screen anyway. So they're just kind of going overboard a little bit. Um, and then they did some kind of strange things uh, to, in my mind anyway, um, they showed their probably their marquee title, the Drake's Fortune series, uh, and then just showed you how you could play it just like on your PS3 with the joysticks, or um, or there's alternate controls, you can play it your way, and then they just drew a line across some golden bricks and just watched a cartoon of the guy doing this difficult climbing maneuver and getting up to the cliff. You know, So either you can play it or not play it and watch it. <laughs> um, and so they're trying to appeal to hardcore and casual with the same title somehow. And then I'm not sure how that, how that works or what the thinking is there. Maybe it's just a tech demo, you know, maybe, hopefully. 
because NPA, the same price as the guy who spent three hours on it. Yeah, fifty dollars or whatever. Yeah, instead of two dollars in the in the iPhone store. Um, I swear one of the Instead of aiming at them. Yeah, yeah. Here, I want you to Yeah, for, for a specific title, right? Yeah. Cool. So I'll just paraphrase. I don't know if everybody can hear that, but let's get this out in the middle somewhere. You can be in charge. But uh, yeah, essentially for a title, they showed. Um, uh, I pause and save, save to the cloud on the PS3, and then I hop in the bus and, and join right back up, or vice versa, uh, from the, the portable. Um, and uh, oh, very quietly, actually, Microsoft announced that they're going to let us start saving stuff to the cloud as well, too. Um, I, that's the kind of thing that's interesting to people that do it. It's not flashy enough to do on a stage, I think, is one of the reasons Microsoft didn't, didn't do it there. It's not a visual thing. Um, and it doesn't cross, you know, it doesn't cross screens, it doesn't cross devices. And the, my immediate question was, so in, for that privilege, I spent $110 on the game, one there, one there, probably is my guess, to be able to play it in two places. But uh, it, it also speaks a little bit to uh, the amount of power in this portable, that they feel brave enough authoring a PS3 game with the same content as on the portable. I'm sure they'll down the textures and all that kind of thing. Um, I haven't seen any specs. Is anybody else for the Vita? Yeah, they bragged about the screen, um, which uh, means it's in 250 is is very subsidized. I don't know why. Well, they're doing it. It's some kind of a strategic move. They're going to lose a lot of money on those. Um, and <laughs> that is kind kind of their model. Yeah. Um, if you've seen a 3DS, the, the analog stick is actually flat and it slides. And it, it's surprisingly good considering this is real sticks that stick up and tilt. And yeah, it'll get hooked on your pocket when you try to jam it in there. I haven't heard anything like that. Let me see. Oh, and this is the other thing that caught my eye there. there. Um, this, this started sounding really exciting. And then it just started getting kind of worse and worse. Um, so this is their 3D TV. Uh, Sony obviously sells a lot of devices. This is a PlayStation branded TV um, with active shutter glasses 3D. And uh, their special gimmick there um, for this particular model is that uh, they have a mode where two people can show up with their glasses. And instead of seeing 3D, they'll each see separate scenes. Because instead of alternating your eyes, it'll start doing both eyes black, both eyes open, and you'll see, then I'll see, and you, you go back and forth. Um, that's pretty neat, but uh, it's $500. The next set of glasses is $70. Um, or three or four. Um, there, there's, there's finally 3D TVs on the market if, if you're excited about 3D that use passive glasses, and the compromise is to give up every other scan line, but at proper distance, most people are really happy with them. And there you're talking about $2 glasses, or I actually took them from the theater when I left. It's the exact same circular polarized that they use in uh, real D theaters. Um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And uh, obviously, uh, if you ever used a 3D uh, shutter monitor, there's ghosting and lag because it can't instantly switch back and forth that good. And I can imagine that gets quite a bit worse when it's changing the entire scene. You know you're in the snow area and I'm in the cave. What, what the heck are we going to see on the screen? So. But it's interesting anyway. Um, and as it says down here at the bottom, the, the dual thing works only on PS3. It doesn't take two HDMI inputs and muck some together and show you two different things. It's only certain PS3 games. OK, that's quite a bit worse. <laughs> as soon as they say the certain, certain titles thing. Um, it's worth mentioning the, the screen attached to the console was done on the PS3 for maybe two or three titles. Did anybody do it? Um, the PSP could. Or remotely interact with with PS3 titles, and you could do remote, kind of remote desktop uh, video gaming if you wanted to. But again, the kiss of death is certain titles. So that's one thing that Nintendo's got going for them is they're going to make everybody do it. And so once you get that device, every game will use it in some way. Um, 
that's another Nintendo. Time check. Okay, we're running out of time here. Um, Microsoft, I thought, uh, was relatively, you know, no, no particular thing standing out. They're, they're finally kind of fleshing out the Kinect stuff. Um, they again have a lot of family titles. The, um, the one that stood out to me is, is that they're starting to use it in their, in their um, high end, you know, whatever you call them, hardcore titles. So, for example, Forza, um, it's not there to let you dance around and change a tire and, you know, do a backflip. It's there so you can look into the corners while you're still playing. And they try to do it so that um, by modeling off of what people do naturally when they lean into corners because they're into the game too much. And um, that just gives you kind of what you need to do to actually race a car because you don't look out the windshield when you're sliding sideways around a corner and that kind of thing. You look into the, the straight line you're trying to get to. Um, and for hardcore titles, you can't really ask for anything more than just the head tracking like that. And then the, from a kind of indie hacker perspective, um, they, called, they launched this thing called Fun Labs. And one of the most interesting things there is one of the titles is actually uh, uh, something that was developed on the open source kind of reverse engineer drivers and then ported uh, to, to the official drivers. And there are official drivers coming for PC. They just are late. Yeah, yeah, technically, yeah. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. If you have it connected, you definitely want to check it out. Um, then the other thing they showed was uh, just some examples of digitizing products in. I, I should have checked which one of these it was. Let's pick one randomly here. I don't think we necessarily need the sound. We're all turned down. And uh, we're just going to show you a little prototype of something we've oh, been no, working with the uh, Microsoft. My bad. Oh no, that is that is ported in there now. They, that's another one that came from the open source drivers and got ported in. Uh, connect. Um, it's sort of like an interactive live puppeteering tool that tracks the silhouette of your arm, and then. Uh, Let's see if they, they actually show it on there. That is the that is the exact same video they originally showed though for the iPad. I'm not actually sure why it's getting featured here. Let me see if I can find the one I was talking about. Um, has anybody actually tried any of this stuff? I didn't. I didn't get a chance to since you left. Do you want, do you want to describe it real quick? I, I failed on the video. Wait. Hello. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I downloaded the Fun Labs app. Um, there's a bunch, it's basically just a bunch of little gadgets. It's almost like its own um, game store. And uh, there are a couple that said they were coming soon. Um, the, there's Googly, there's Google, Googly Eyes, um, Bobbleheads, uh, Connect Me, and there was a, um, oh, Make a Buddy or Build a Buddy, where you can scan an object and it creates one out of it. So you can give it the front and the back and it tries to make this animal or creature out of it, you can give it um, you can give it different personality traits and it takes that on and it records your it records your voice so when it does certain things it'll play your voice back at a different pitch. Just kind of okay. interesting. Uh, my daughter, she tried her cat and it did not work that well. It, it The front and back did not come out you all that well. I tried my little gizmo um, thing and it worked rather well for that. You kind of need them to be the same shape on front and back probably? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the connect me thing actually worked pretty well. Um, it takes it takes pictures of you and tries to make an avatar that looks just like you. Um, it still doesn't support fat people. The, I don't think they're ever going to support the fat people and in, in the avatars. Um, so I ended up looking very flattering. Um, but it actually did a really good job at taking the pictures of what was on my shirt. I was wearing my X-Men shirt that has like 20 X-Men characters on it. And I could distinctively see probably about 15 of them within the shirt that it made. The one problem is you can't make your real avatar out of that. Microsoft doesn't let you do that. 
Um, the bobblehead used the same thing, but then it just super, it makes your head really big and you record a sound. And you can share all of the things you create in these Fun Labs things on connectshare.com. That sounds dangerous. Yeah, it, I think it is. <laughs> but it was, still, it was pretty fun for a family thing. Yeah. But um, there was one that was coming that, oh, the, the drawing demo they showed. It's not up there yet. Yeah. The okay. 3D drawing one, that one looked really fun. Yeah, that that was that was my favorite thing of of the demos. Um, so the guy essentially took some 2D stills of himself, placed them at depths in the scene, and then took his hand and drew in 3D. So he was able to draw circles around his his cardboard cutout of himself in 3D space, in front and behind, and above and above and below. Yeah, and that did show one of the new features that they're giving developers for Connect was the the hand um, finger tracking yep. they added in. Which will be interesting to see. The, that um, gun builder demo for Ghost Recon, that I think was probably the best demonstration of using Connect out of anything they showed. Because it was finally, it looked like a fluent interface that didn't have your hand sitting there and you have to hold it up. It was just little flicks. Yeah, and that's a good point too. Uh, on, on these hardcore titles, they're trying to not wreck it. Obviously, they've invested so much money, uh, they don't want to be the one that got wrecked by Connect. So it, it's, they showed some other things like um, you can just yell out to your squad mates. It's not featured as much, but Connect actually has a lot of audio processing going on. It's got, I think, four or six microphones. And when you set it up, you, um, you let it run through its calibration where it's putting crazy sounds out of your speakers and then figuring out how to cancel all those sounds so that all those noises bounce around the room and you're exploding and shooting and um, screaming. And whatever's happening, it's picking up the human voice separate from the, the output from the game. Um, and it puts quite a bit of uh, horsepower into trying to process and eliminate all those sounds. Um, so it, people say it, it kind of is a breakthrough in terms of um, the the audio if you calibrate it. I mean, people's general experience with Connect is it just sounds like an echoey mess versus the headset. But that's because oh, they don't I've, bother to run the calibrator. I've actually I haven't calibrated mine. I had brought it here. Mm -hmm. I was a beta tester, so I had it. I've had it since um, beginning of September last year, and I had brought it here and we played it and whatnot. And I calibrated it for our old theater, and then brought it home and never calibrated, it and it still works great. I don't know if they have some sort of auto calibration now, oh, okay. but I only had to go through that once. Interesting. Yeah, I think it, it might have something to do with, with speakers as well, if you, especially if you have surround sound speakers aiming forwards or something of that nature. Um, so the only, uh, anybody else want to talk about any Microsoft stuff that I missed? I know I did really brief there. We kind of run out New of New interface. So what struck you about that? Huh? The new interface. Oh, I wasn't being snarky. There's a new interface yep. based on Windows Phone 7 type tiles and Windows 8. Yeah. And it's got the Bing voice search feature, which might actually be really nice because, yeah, trying to find games through there and anything through the current interface is a pain in the ass. That's a good point. It, it, it's uh, navigating these menus and you have to know exactly where you're going. And uh, it, it's really painful. And people that have ever thought about publishing indie games or have published indie games feel that pain really severely. Um, like, they, they would informally poll people and they're like, oh, I didn't even know that stuff was on there. You know, that kind of thing. And Microsoft's solution was, well, just use a website to point them to it. And of course, that's not, that's not how you do it. Still can't even search the website marketplace. You still have to go through oh. categories. I was just on there the other day. I'm like, where the hell is the search? Because that's when I download, I set the fun labs to download while I was, while they were demonstrating it. So it'd be ready for when I got home. Yeah. And I guess the other thing from a, a business perspective, they didn't actually have any any there there yet. Um, they're they're going to do uh, IPTV and uh, DVR recording functionality. Um, and they've only announced TV partners in Europe so far, I believe. But those the, And some of those they are already doing. The Sky TV has yeah. actually been, I think it's since last year. But yeah, they're not going to be able to make it here unless they get partnered at least with Comcast or DirecTV. And yeah, that's the last thing they want. Yeah. <laughs> it's Xbox in between them and their customers. Well, Comcast is hooking up like with TiVo. The Xfinity um, yeah, cool. on-demand stuff is coming to TiVo, so they may be finally wising up. Um, and then, the, um, as my personal pick, uh, you guys all have to watch a Battlefield 3 clip. Um, I'm a graphics geek, and um, I think this is this is the engine that's not 
uh, dumb and down for consoles. It's uh, if you want the best experience, you get a DirectX 11 video card. You play it on a PC, uh, maybe a Mac. I can't speak to that. Um, <laughs> if you had that much money, though, just get a bigger monitor. Um, <laughs> yeah, is that good? But um, so things to look for here. Uh, D Damien called it. Um, a lot, a lot of the DirectX 9 engines, the, the fallback effect is shiny and they just use it on everything in order to accentuate the bumps in the normal maps and that kind of thing. Um, here, um, actually I can, uh, I can dig up the PDF again, but here in DirectX 11 you get the compute shaders and you aren't using a conventional graphics pipeline. Only for graphics uh, you get to compute things similar to what the PS3 cell chip was supposed to be used for. Um, and so you can throw any math you want through that, not, uh, not our, our tired old 256 values of red, 256 values of green, but high dynamic range, you can calculate it uh, without all the kind of the hacks and compression that have to be done to get it done within the DirectX 9 pipeline. Um, uh, I don't know actually. Yeah. Um, I think not because they, they do have to release it on consoles. Yeah. Um, and, and these guys are, are always on the cutting edge. They've been talking about this stuff at, at SIGGRAPH since like uh, 2009 or so of using uh, general calculations to output graphics at the end, but you're not going through the normal stages of the graphics pipeline like everybody else. Um, so the things to look for is just a uh, very, very different kind of realistic view to everything. Um, let me see if I can get it to play again. What? What? Thank you. Right there. I haven't, uh, has anybody heard kind of extensively about uh, the destructive stuff? I know it's not just one time set pieces the way a lot of the modern games do it, but it's actual, you know, this is your cover and it gets destroyed kind of thing. Yeah, I was, I watched the interview um, for that on G4 yesterday. They just, they just barely said that, yeah, everything, like almost everything is going to be destructible. They did talk a lot about the other, demo, the other they showed that you had playing when we first came in the, the tank demo. Yeah, I, the I recommend. The open spaces, holy shit, is that beautiful. Yeah, I recommend, uh, there's a, a clip just called the tank demo. I recommend everybody watches that on a real monitor. Um, because we're, we're losing a little bit of our dark details and that's just natural with the projected thing that's not in a light controlled theater, you know, in the absolute darkness. Um, it's, uh, it's a great example of their tone mapping where you're, you're driving through the desert and the ground's basically blinding. It looks like almost a snow field if, if that's what it looked like yesterday when we were watching it on the stream. Um, but then as soon as the, all this nice looking smoke obscures the sun, uh, everything in the scene adjusts like your iris or a camera would adjust and you see all this detail around you and then the colors come out. So it's not just that they're blowing everything out but they're really doing some complex kind of real lighting calculations and everything. Um, it re reminds me of the first time I saw um, Drake's Fortune graphics uh, and you can actually tell that that's supposed to be sunlight. That's not just bright white because white means bright, right? No, it doesn't. White means white. But they're doing the, the colors and, and all the lighting calculations that go into real uh, lighting physics, light physics, photons and so on. Um, so we got anything else that we, that we missed? Any specific craziness, games, anything? Hardware? Um, there's one thing that wasn't at E3, but um, the other thing I'm going to force you to pay attention to. Um, so kind of a, a hardware geek, but they aren't giving up on the goggles yet. Um, they haven't made progress in a while, but this is a company um, that was showing stuff less than an inch and uh, 
equivalent to a monitor, so like 10 or 12, 1200 pixels to a side. Um, it, it, it's really stagnated uh, at, at these super low res things, and so you can't use them for anything good. But they're kind of claiming that that uh, that this could be something. It'd be nice to see. I mean, um, with the, the way the portables are headed, it won't be long before we're looking at stuff inside our glasses. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Um, we didn't do a registration tonight, so if uh, you did not actually register at the website and you want to get on future emails, um, just make sure you get over to IGDATC.org and uh, just drop an email there to, we've actually got an alias, IGDATC at IGDATC.org. Um, otherwise, uh, you maybe found us on Facebook, Twitter, or one of those other crazy uh, new internet things. Um, and uh, we'll continue doing that like we always have. Um, okay, we're just going to take a, a quick break if uh, anybody needs to run off for a couple minutes, and Zach's going to set up for uh, the main, main talk. All right, um, I, did, I did a bad job of uh, covering the uh, routine things, but uh, um, normally we do a, a short thing every, every session and then a, a longer talk. Uh, recently we haven't done that, partially because um, people had so many projects to present at once, we just did the main speaker. But um, next month, um, Pete, you've got a couple of students that are going to show their senior projects. Do you, do you want to give uh, a preview or you want to surprise us? Well, I mean, just do you want to describe it real quick? Uh, so we're, it's our last, one of our last classes in our uh, gaming program at MSB. And uh, so basically what we did was we started a game from scratch and we're working our way towards the end here. So um, there's a lot of hard work. I mean, we're putting in at least eight hours in class a week and then who knows how many hours outside of class. But basically, um, it's, it's kind of like an artillery game. You are, basically, you're this one planet and then there's another planet that you're fighting against with, uh, with the other player. Um, there's multiple choices of weapons and um, it's just this gravity and <laughs> asteroids and it's just, it's, it's, it's a really fun, fun game, I think, so. Um, we have a working demo. Um, something playable, so if a few of you guys want to test it out for us tonight, then we can get some more ideas, polish it up, and then by next month we'll have something really cool, so um, yeah, I think that's where we'll just leave it for now. So. Perfect, thank you. Yep, and, and the motivation is just, um, you know, to get a lot of people involved. Um, we've had just mods, mods for levels. Um, some point I'll get around to the showing off the, the some of the Connect stuff, or maybe when the new SDK comes out. Um, but just anything. Don't uh, think your project's too small or too uninteresting. Or um, uh, the other one is is afraid to talk in front of a group. It's a scary, common thing. You will not find a friendlier group than this. You saw how badly I screwed up the videos. Nobody yelled at me. Yeah. Well, Scott's the scariest. Um, so uh, get, get a hold of us, IGDATC, if you'd like to do a short session, you know, from 10 to 20 minutes, um, or, or the, the main event, if you got something to talk about. We really will cover anything on any, any platform. Uh, we've done interactive fiction, that counts as a game. We've done board games, it's been a while. Do you have more board game people in town coming? He moved. <laughs> but uh, there's a few people still in town. But. Um, yeah, so uh, just get in touch if you'd, if you'd like to present. We'd love to hear from you. We need artists. Okay, yep. Here. The UDev Games Contest is starting on July 1st. It's, uh, if you go to udevgames.com, it explains it. But basically, it's a three-month contest for uh, game developers who are targeting Macs. Um, if you want to do Mac, Windows, iOS, whatever, you can do it, but as long as your game runs on a Mac, uh, the contest starts July 1st, and there's like $30,000 worth of prizes because it includes like Unity licenses, so. It, UDev means it's Unity only? No, uh, it, it's whatever, anything, any way you want to do it. Cool. And uh, let's, let's get all the way back here to Zach, not to be confused with Zach. Um, <laughs> It reminded me because he originally presented for us uh, in the in the intro session when we were at the chatterbox, and actually when Annie and Scott were presenting there, uh, Holly Moon. 
So uh, let's hear it for Zags Johnson. All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, basically web-based game development. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw some pretty sweet stuff from E3 today. Uh, with uh, WebGL coming out, which I'll talk a bit, a bit later, um, WebGL is a, a basically OpenGL for the browser. Some of this really fancy stuff is going to start to be possible. Um, I, Google's already ported Quake 2 to WebGL, for instance. So you're kind of, a, you know, about that level and, and kind of it's getting faster uh, every month. But for the most part, uh, this is kind of more casual game, flash game kind of territory is where the web's at now. It's, it's definitely um, not, not any worse than flash at this point. It's completely caught up to flash um, in terms of performance. I'd, I'd say that pretty confidently. So just to kind of set it up, uh, it's not, I don't know if I'd call it a hardcore platform quite yet, but anyway. All right, so what does HTML5 have to do with video games? Uh, and, and what the hell is HTML5, right? So uh, mostly and, and specifically HTML5 is a markup language. It's just, you know, there was HTML4 before that and there was XHTML. It's just the new markup language, um, you know, and so there's some new tags. There's a canvas tag I'll talk about, audio, video, and then there's things like article, nav, header, footer. They've just extended the language by adding tags. But when people talk about HTML5, they, they use it as a marketing buzzword that means these new tags like Canvas and Audio, but they're also grouping into that CSS3, which is uh, cascading style sheets. It's a, a way to describe things visually uh, in the browser. And then they're also kind of putting in that bucket a, a highly optimized uh, JavaScript engine because all the browsers now have like just-in-time compiling and all these other tricks that they've pulled out. So JavaScript's extremely fast now. Um, which didn't used to be the case. And can you actually uh, use this stuff now? So a lot of people like to talk about all these cool things that browsers are doing, but you can't use them in Internet Explorer, you can't use them here, you can't use them there, they don't work. So I'll, I'll kind of cover that. Um, and yes, you can use this stuff now. That's, that's the good news. And I'm going to start with Canvas and with audio. So the audio tag, um, well, it lets you play audio. Big, big surprise there. So you can do background music for your game. You can do sound effects for your game. You have volume control, and you can do multiple channels and stuff simultaneously. But it's pretty basic, and it's just a generic, you basically have a generic JavaScript API to deal with your audio for your game. You, you don't have, like, a lot of control over doing, like, pitch shifting and, and some of the really low-level stuff. Um, Firefox has an API for that, but that's, like, again, that's, like, one browser that does it. But if you want cross-browser support, you basically just have, you know, you shoot your gun, it makes a bang sound, the guy screams, and you have, you know, background audio, that kind of thing. And then there's this canvas tag, which is really what's kind of enabled um, a whole new slew of games to be possible in, in JavaScript and, and not use Flash. Um, and that, the canvas tag is a 2D drawing surface. It's really low level. You can do direct pixel manipulation if you want. And then they have higher level functions for doing paths um, that you can stroke and fill and that you can do images and circles and, and all sorts of stuff. But you can, you can go right down to the pixel level if you want to. And again, this is a, a generic JavaScript API you use to draw. It's not game specific, so you're not getting, you know, like a, a whole game loop or something like that. It's just really raw, basic, I want to blit pixels to, you know, a raster surface. It's not vector, it's, it's an array of pixels. You guys can ask questions at any time. I'm totally cool with that. Are you going to do it at a high level or should we drill into it right now? Questions? Are you going to circle back with the low levels like an audio or far away right now? Am I going to? Well, uh, I wasn't actually going to get that detailed on, on how you actually use the audio tag, but I could do that. Sure. So it, it supports. Um, that's one of the things where the browser differences start to, to matter. So Firefox currently is is Aug Vorbis. And I, and I think wa uncompressed wave are the only two formats they support. So you basically you do a game, you, you're, you're doing everything in MP3 and Aug Vorbis if you want to be cross browser. Basically, you're, you're stuck doing two encodings. Um, but they, so you, you got MP3, you got Aug, and then you have, un, you know, uncompressed stuff like wave. Um, and you can, you know, preload everything. You, you kind of go through a load cycle when your game starts and you kind of spool everything in. They have different kind of preloading so you can have stuff where it'll start playing once enough of it has streamed in for like a bigger background music track and that kind of thing. Uh, you, can, you can skip around in the tracks. So a lot of people are doing now what they call uh, audio spriting where they, they have like a bunch of audio all in one file and they just hop around inside of it. And you can't do multi-channel inside that one instance 
but um, you know, it kind of loads faster and you, you don't have as much latency with um, triggering like a new audio object and stuff like that. Uh, but you can, you don't really have a problem with latency as long as you preload everything that you need. To do some of the multi-channel stuff, it's, it's still a little bit crude because a lot of times you'll have to like create uh, multiple instances of a sound object if you want to like, you know, duplex it or whatever. So if you want to have like the same exact boom sound play five times, you might need to have five instances of that boom sound. Otherwise, if you hit play again, it's going to jump back to zero and just cut. Yeah. Okay. Um, any, and just raise your hand if you have any question at any point. I'll try and spot so you. Also the Mozilla, yeah. Uh, audio spec that they're mm -hmm. Well, the, the two big, um, you know, I guess I'd say the two big innovators in terms of browser technology are Mozilla and then WebKit, which is Chrome and Safari. Um, and I know that WebKit's trying to play catch up in that space and, and have like a fully featured, because Mozilla's pushed it back to the, the standards body. They've said, you know, hey, we developed this cool audio API, you know, push it back to the W3C and say, well, what do you think? And, and so I, I think that, um, you know, in a couple of iterations of these browsers, you'll see something that lets you do lower level stuff like, you know, change the pitch and all that kind of, yeah. 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 It's, not, it's not quite there yet, though. Good. It's good to get that background. Yeah. How those maneuvers are working. Yeah, absolutely. Good questions. Um, okay. I'm sorry? Yes. Yep. So uh, they have a function where you can just grab you know, a chunk of a chunk of a bitmap from one file and, and blit it into your surface. Otherwise, you can do low-level stuff where you're working with raw pixel data. Um, and, and I mean, it supports pings with alpha transparency, so it's actually really easy to do sprites. You can have like an alpha transparent sprite and a ping in, in 2D and just blit it into your surface and it handles everything for you really easily. But um, you know, if you wanted to get really low-level and work at a pixel level, um, you know, so that you can control your color channels or stuff like that, you can certainly do that. Um, you know, it's got uh, 32 bit color plus a full alpha channel, so you can, for each pixel, you can manipulate that. Um, all right, so I think that more or less covers uh, Canvas. So I want to jump in and, and show you it in, in action. I mean, why not, right? So uh, I, I recently made this game. There was a, if you guys have heard of the experimental gameplay project, every month they, they uh, do a theme based contest. So basically, you have seven days to make a a game for their theme, and their theme a couple months ago was a cheap clone. So I did like a cheap running, glunt, uh, running gun kind of uh, Contra style game. For this, um, this is canvas and the audio tag for the, the visuals and for the sound. And uh, I used something called the Akihabara engine, which is a, a JavaScript based uh, video game engine that I'll talk about a little bit more. So I'm just going to quick uh, show you what this game is all about. All right. So there's your load cycle, it's pretty quick. It's gonna be hard to play and hold a controller. I mean a mic. Okay. It's also difficult to play uh, platformers without a gamepad. So you know you've got your kind of basic uh, shoot 'em up kind of game here. So, uh, being that it's a cheap clone, the, the thanks, this would be perfect. Hey. All right, so uh, this is probably directional. Huh? Being that it's um, a cheap clone, the kind of joke was that the, like, the monsters are all cheap too. So you're like just battling like targets to shoot, which is kind of a, like, the gag here. Um, so I've got, you know, like, uh, several layers of parallax in the background and a tile-based, tile-based map. It's, uh, you're, you're pretty standard, uh, kind of Contra style game. Kind of want to play it to the end because it's rather hilarious. You all just run through it. Quick. You guys can all marvel at my playing skills on the keyboard. Yes. Thank you. This is my first uh, full.
full walk cycle of a 2D character without using a template. Alright, so then, uh, the kind of ubiquitous boss fight. Yes. <laughs> Actually, only one level, so I'm not going to make you sit through it. But um. well, well, I want to see the uh, like after you shoot that big target. I'm sure you do want to see. Well, there's a URL there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you want to play through it, honestly, you can you can jot that down, or I think the the slides I'm going to give them uh, to Ryan, right? Okay. Yeah, and so you. We'll have all the URLs there too, so uh, you can definitely play. It's just the one level, um, you know. Like I said, I did it in like a week. Uh, it was uh, it was what I the project I used to learn this Akihabara engine. It's it's pretty pretty decent engine. I'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, and that will be the very next thing I talk about. And then uh, this was the game actually uh, that I presented um, the first time that Zach had me come talk here. Uh, I had done a game for a, a Boing Boing contest. They had this game inspired by music uh, competition where you had to like make make the game for the chip tune rather than make a game and then get the chip tune. It was like you know, kind of do it backwards. And so this um, is probably very difficult to see because the game's called Infiltration at Dusk, so it's getting progressively darker the longer. Oh, that's not bad actually. All right, so. Um, this is another canvas-based game, and this one has uh, real-time 2D lighting effects. So I'm kind of using masking and stuff to um, to do 2D. Don't hit the command key to do the lighting, and it's a keyboard masher. So wherever you kind of mash on the keyboard is where you fire, and it gets kind of hectic the longer you play. So, um, but the kind of unique thing about this is is uh, it's showing off you know, your ability to do some of the kind of more sophisticated kind of pixel level manipulation. In the, drawing surface that lets you kind of, um, you know, you can draw a background and then put a mask over it and cut parts of the mask out to control your, like, lighting levels and stuff like that, so, anyway. All right, so, and this one also you can play online if you're so inclined. It has a high score table. So, to uh, Zach's question, uh, these work in Safari, they work in Chrome, they work in Firefox, they work in Opera. And they do work in Internet Explorer 9. Hey, Internet Explorer 9. Yay. So, um, yeah, you know, Internet Explorer's, uh, bless their hearts, has, you know, finally decided to come around a little bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it probably sucks in IE, right? And no, actually, it doesn't. It, they're using DirectX hardware acceleration in the Canvas, and they have one of the, so they have one of the fastest Canvas implementations that's available right now. Um, I've, I've tested my games in virtualization on a Mac and they run faster than like Safari runs it without the virtualization layer. You know, like I'm running like Windows 7 on my Mac in virtualization and yeah, the DirectX uh, just goes straight to hardware, the graphics card, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, so yeah, good point. How, what is the performance of the Canvas tag? Um, honestly, in a, in a, you know, quote unquote desktop environment, your desktop, your laptop, it's, it's really good. Um, You've got hardware acceleration to a, a, a big extent in Chrome and IE9 in particular, um, with the hardware acceleration being slightly better on Windows than Mac in my experience. And then uh, Safari and Firefox have have some level of hardware acceleration, but like they don't have full on like this is you know a hardware managed drawing surface, and I'm offloading all of my drawing operations to it. But they're getting there really quickly. You know, neither neither the Mozilla Foundation nor uh, you know Apple likes being behind anybody in these things. So it's it's with Safari, it's probably 5.1 or 2, whatever the next Safari will probably have it. And um, I don't know, uh, Firefox claims, like they had this big article where they were kind of point for point saying, you know, Microsoft is full of crap and ours is hardware accelerated. But um, nonetheless, they're not quite, they're not doing like the same level of direct hardware access. I think because Microsoft, you know, owns DirectX, I think they could kind of sneak in with, inter with Internet Explorer to kind of, uh, you know, make stuff work a little bit faster. Um, so I want to qualify very good a little bit and rather than like show you some sort of, you know, 
demo where I'm drawing thousands of sprites to the screen or something. I thought I could use it like actual games as an analogy. So you could use Canvas for a desktop game or a laptop game and you could do Tiny Wings or Angry Birds or Super Mario World or Zelda Link to the Past. You could do all those 60 frames a second, no problem. I mean that's, you know, that's where you are. So you could do a really, I use two examples which are very popular casual games in the iOS market or um, you know you could probably do better than Super Nintendo. That's just kind of, I just picked two games you'd be familiar with. But um, in, in terms of making a 2D game it's, it's, it's very good where it is right now. Um, so moving on a little bit, what about the physics part of Angry Birds? If I'm assuming you've all probably are one of the hundred million people who've played Angry Birds by now, but um, Angry Birds is a physics based, based game. You throw the birds and they smash into stuff and the blocks fall down uh, using 2D physics. Um, but Canvas is just a, a raw drawing tool. So like you've got to create your own game loop and listen to the user inputs and if you have a physics based game you have to implement your own physics. Um, and this is where the fast JavaScript engines really come to the rescue. It's because the browsers now have all done this like just in time compiling and all this stuff, they've really made floating point math very quick. And there's actually two ports of uh, box 2D physics uh, to JavaScript. I think it started in C and then went to ActionScript for Flash and someone actually just did like a, uh, a machine, one, the first person just did like a machine port of ActionScript to JavaScript. Um, didn't do it by hand and then somebody else started like a GitHub project and, and did another port of box 2D physics. So um, for, for physics and JavaScript most people are using box 2D but uh, maybe chipmunk will be a possibility someday. I'd be happy to see that. Um, so I just want to show like where, where physics are kind of at right now um, in the JavaScript world. So this is actually, I'm going to go back to my hand. So, so this is um, a little jetpack kind of game demo here, and you can see it's got physics on the bullets and on these boxes. So your basic kind of 2D game physics. This uh, this demo is done with an engine called Impact. Um, everything's being drawn in a canvas, and uh, like I said, box 2D physics is a JavaScript. Uh, Part of the physics library. Impact's, um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's like a $100 one time fee. It's a commercial product rather than Akihabara, which is uh, actually a free product. Um, and this runs, I mean, you could abuse this a lot more on the desktop. This isn't even really trying it at all. Um, you know, you could, do, you could do bigger objects and a lot more of them, and you'd have perfectly decent 2D physics here. Uh, And, um, and I have another physics demo I'll show you here. This is one I did. Now this one's, um, it's not truly a game, but it's an interactive thing. And, and this one doesn't actually use Canvas to do any of the rendering. This is uh, using um, HTML and CSS3 to do the rendering, and then Box2D to do the physics. And I'm gonna get into a second about why, you know, you wouldn't want to do everything in Canvas. So here, let me, let me show you. So here you've got like 3D cubes that, don't drag the windows Zach. You got 3D cubes that are being, you know, manipulated in 2D space. So the physics is 2D but the, the drawing is 3D. And so you can toss these things around all you want. Um, you know, this is pretty simple, simple physics. The, the ports of box 2D actually do handle, you know, everything that typically a 2D physics engine handles, it, you know, it does circles and different odd shaped objects and springs and, and that kind of thing. Um, so you don't have to be, you don't even have to be this simple with it. Um, so like I said, this isn't drawn with canvas. So I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have like a JavaScript uh, 3D renderer here where I'm drawing, you know, I'm doing all the 3D math and drawing into a 2D surface. This is, this is HTML and CSS um, that does this. I could actually show you here. So like, um, if you look at the code, you know, you're defining the six sides of a, of a cube as HTML tags and then you've got uh, these kind of magical CSS properties that actually let you do rotation in 3D space. Um, so it's, it, basically the reason why you'd ever want to do that, um, there's a few of them. I mean, basically, uh, 
sometimes it's better to, to kind of skip the whole canvas thing because the, the HTML and CSS is a bit higher level, so it can speed up your development cycle, actually, depending on your game. Some things are just not possible with it, but if your, your game is possible within the realm of HTML and CSS, it's, there's such high level tools that you can kick stuff out really rapidly. Um, like it would have been a lot more work to do a 3D rendering engine for cubes than to just tell the browser, hey, make me a cube. Um, there's also more backwards compatibility with HTML and CSS based games because uh, the canvas tag only works in like IE9, but HTML and CSS based games, you go have a game for IE8 or IE7. Um, maybe the most compelling reason is that it can actually outperform canvas in the mobile space um, in iOS. So like my demo with the, the 3D cubes that you can throw around, that runs really well um, in, uh, like on an iPhone that runs really well, but if you were to write your own 3D renderer and, and render into a canvas, it would be really, really slow. Well, CSS3 is the newest spec of, it's like the newest version of CSS. So like the kind of 3D cubes I made with CSS, you could only do with browsers that support that, and that's like a new CSS3 property. Um, so no, unfortunately, like, you can't just make a game with JavaScript and HTML5 and it will for sure work on an iPhone. You know, that's like something you might kind of naively think, but there's a lot of it depends um, to do something like that. Um, the gotchas for doing an HTML5 game and, and using it in a mobile, mobile environment, there's quite a few of them. The audio tag is crippled in mobile web browsers. Um, like basically if you load something on your I iPhone in a browser, um, it'll only basically do a background track and that's only like after the user takes some action. Like you can only, you can only trigger a sound based on like the user actually clicking on something or giving some like direct input. You can't, you can't programmatically generate sounds. You can't have like two sprites shoot each other and create a, a, a boom sound effect. It's just how they've defined it. Um, and I, I think it's because they want to avoid, you know, people being on their phones on a website and having some gimmicky audio, you know, ads or whatever popping up. They, they think they want to mind people's battery and bandwidth so they don't want people dumping all this audio on them. But it's unfortunately crippled um, mobile based, mobile web browser based games with audio. A canvas is really slow and not hardware accelerated on mobile devices. Um, so you can, you can still do games with canvas but you have to have small sprites, not very many parallax layers, like there's a lot of kind of compromises you have to make. Um, and to the point I was kind of making just a second ago, HTML and CSS actually, ironically in a way, are, are hardware accelerated on an iPhone and an iPad. So if you, uh, if you make all your sprites in your game like little HTML divs with background images or whatever, you can, you can like translate those across the screen with like affine transformations and that's all dumped to the, the graphics card and all hardware accelerated and works really well. But if you try to ma animate all those sprites in the canvas, um, you know, you're going to use up a lot of CPU and battery on, on the eye devices right now. Um, one kind of subtle thing is that you don't want to use mouse events on iOS, you want to use touch events. You might make this amazing game and then you try and use it on your iPhone and it just doesn't work right because you've used you know, mouse events or keyboard events or whatever that you have to think about the context you're in because people, you know, play games by touching on the iPhone, they don't use a mouse, they don't use the keyboard, so you have to kind of account for that in your input loop. Um, and you pretty much have to give up the idea of physics if you're going to go uh, make a game in HTML5 for mobile. Like Box2D is, is, you maybe could do like 10 boxes and it would be pushing it. Um, the math heavy things are just too slow in JavaScript um, on mobile devices right now. Is there a multi-touch uh, thing that can be used across different browsers? Yes, there is a multi-touch API. So you certainly can do like you know, as many multi-finger gesture inputs to your game as you want, which actually means you could do some kind of novel, you know, casual games with new input things and, and build them with JavaScript. You don't have to do it in like Objective-C. You, you have low-level access to the touch inputs. And it sounds like there's a lot of problems and like, you know, oh, I, I guess you can't make a mobile game with HTML5, but um, there's actually a ton of games you can still make even within the limitations and there's, um, there's like commercial 
an actual commercial marketplace that's farming around this. There's a few companies that have popped up that are soliciting games from people and, and paying pretty well uh, to do, you know, clones of like Frogger and Bejeweled and some of these games, which you can totally do within the limitations and, and rather than it being, you know, a, a flash based economy on the bro in like the desktop browser, it's a, uh, an HTML5 based game economy um, in uh, the mobile space and they uh, they make their money by ads, I imagine, or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's these kind of HTML5 game publishers that have popped up. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about tools to help you use some of this technology. I don't know if this is hopefully getting picked up. Um, all right, so one of the tools I mentioned was uh, Aki Havara. Uh, so this is the URL for it. Um, this is a canvas based game library, so it uses canvas to do all its drawing and audio tag to do all the audio. Uh, this one's both free and open source MIT license, so you have a ton of flexibility to do whatever you really want with it. Um, one of the cool things about it is, is uh, it comes with a ton of examples of uh, different games you could make. Actually, just uh, since I have the benefit of the network, I'll pop it up here. So uh, these are all the example games you just kind of get for free. They're like kind of, it almost becomes a framework because you have all these example games you can just start within the, the kind of box they give you. So they have a classic platformer, they have a kind of, um, what do they call it, uh, a belt shooter where it's like scrolling up into the screen of the spaceship shooter. It's got a, a Zelda clone, uh, Tetris, Pac-Man, it even has a rhythm game. So you, you just kind of get out of the box all these different examples which really help you spool up really quickly to make uh, a game that's in one of these kind of, one of these kind of genres here. Um, the performance is really good on the desktop and actually, um, uh, what did I do? Where did my, there we go. So um, it actually does, it supports mobile web out of the box actually. Um, all those demos that they have of all the different genres, you can pull those up on an iPad or an iPhone and they run really well uh, because they've limited the, the, they don't have a lot of parallax going on where you have like big layers being moved um, and they're using smaller sprite and tile sizes which are the two biggest things to kind of make Canvas uh, not chug along on, in an iOS environment. Um, so that's kind of neat. You can make a game with Akihabara and it, and it kind of comes with on screen, it just has built in on screen like D-pad and XYZ buttons and you can, you can do a game and it works really well. Um, as long as you kind of, I mean you can break it by adding too many graphics or giant sprites or whatever and it'll start slowing down. Impact which I also mentioned, um, this is another canvas based tool. Now this one's commercial so it's a $99 flat fee, there's no like royalties or anything like that, it's just a one time fee. Um, and it does support plugins and custom modules. Um, so you can extend it and there's people in the community that do that. It comes with a visual uh, level editor which is you know, kind of nice. You can, you can do, uh, it's a tile editor so you can like kind of draw out your map and put in events and stuff like that. Um, and this is the one where Box2D Physics is already plugged in. So I showed you the jetpack demo with the guy shooting the bullets that's pushing the boxes. That's just something that comes with the library. They have that all wired up already for you. Um, this one also supports uh, mobile web out of the box. And what's interesting actually is the guy who made this uh, made a tool called Im uh, iOS Impact or Impact iOS where he's um, kind of wrote a tool that will automatically port your, your JavaScript and Canvas game to a native iOS app that uh, still uses JavaScript for the AI and the like in-game logic but um, it does all the graphics rendering in OpenGL so he's kind of like written a wrapper that takes all what should be JavaScript canvas calls and turns them all into OpenGL calls. So you get um, you know, a little bit more flexibility in, in your performance and, and graphics with impact. Um, it works pretty well. I mean it's still really, he just kind of just did like an alpha of it but um, I think he continue, he'll continue to support it. I think it'll be a pretty strong tool. Um, so talking a little bit about how you can take an HTML5 game and, and package it as an actual bona fide native iOS app, I want to talk about other distribution options with HTML5 games. I mean the obvious thing is you can just release it through a browser. You can make a game that's browser based and put it up on a site or find a distributor. Uh, there's like HTML5games.com and just like there's these big, you know, flash based sites like Congregate and stuff, they're starting to pop up for HTML5 games. So you can, you can push your game out browser based that way. I'm actually thinking that, that Congregate and Newgrounds and stuff will 
will come around and realize that they should also support HTML5 games within those uh, within their communities. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before they really just bite the bullet and do that. They don't right now, though. Everything's still flash there. Um, but there's other options. So one product is uh, Titanium, and this is free and open source, and it will let you package your HTML5 game uh, as a native executable for Windows, Linux, Mac, Mac App Store, iOS App Store, Android, and I think they're even getting into like BlackBerry and stuff. Um, you know, basically the way that it works from a technology standpoint is it just takes a uh, takes the source code of, of WebKit, a, a browser rendering engine, it sticks all of your, your, your JavaScript code and everything into that and then it just wraps a native shell around it. So it's your, your kind of web view is just a, like a UI view inside of a native application is how it works. Um, but it, I mean it works fine. I, the, in the desktop you get the same performance you get out of like Chrome, which is uh, you can do really good games. And then uh, in the mobile space it uses the, the uh, WebKit that's built into the phone, so you, whatever mobile Safari can do, your your app can do. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ones that are just like this. Phone Gap is basically Titanium, just by a different publisher. There's one called NimbleKit. You can also distribute your game through the Chrome Web Store. So Chrome has this whole marketplace they started that's like browser-based, and you can publish your game in the Chrome Web Store, and then people who have Chrome can you know pay through Google Checkout or whatever to buy your game and play it in their browser. Um, I know there's at least one, I don't know where they're out of, but there's a studio called Lost Decade Games that has been blogging a lot about their attempt at monetizing a HTML5 game through the Chrome uh, web store. And they, they also published it in the Mac App Store and they said their Mac App Store sales were almost nothing and their Chrome web store sales were really good, so I don't know what that means. Um, and then just a reminder that Impact, you can go from Impact to iOS as a native app too. Um, so I haven't said much about 3D games. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about WebGL, just quickly. So uh, I kind of started off with this. WebGL is an implementation of OpenGL in the browser. Um, it's actually a different context for Canvas. Like when you create a Canvas, you say give me a 2D context or not, you can say give me this WebGL uh, context. So this is a hardware accelerated and really low level. Um, like I said, they've, they've done Quake 2. Uh, that runs totally fine in WebGL, um, and if you really if you really like GL and really familiar with it, you'd be totally at home. I mean, it's got shaders and all the other. I mean, it's GL. Um, so I haven't had a ton of chance to play with it, mostly because my GL skills are not very strong. But <laughs> um, it's. I mean, people are doing incredible things with it. It's. It's. It kind of blows me away. Um, but you know, as spiffy as it sounds, right now it's only Chrome 10 and 10 Plus and, and Firefox 4 Plus are the only places that have it. Um, although Safari, the very next full point release of Safari, will support it. Um, you can actually like turn it on manually in Safari right now, but you have to like go through some special menu to do it. So it's not like you can't publish a game that way because people will be like, "Why well, doesn't work?" Um, and then Opera says they're going to support it, but uh, there's not a real clear timeline there. And this is one of those things where there's no love from Internet Explorer and there's no love on iOS. Um, so WebGL is, is pretty hardcore, but it's going to be a while before you can use it in every browser. Um, yeah? They just have not, so IE 10's coming out really quickly, which is rare for them to do another browser so quickly. They're, they're speeding up the release cycle, but they haven't announced WebGL for IE 10 either, so it's kind of ambiguous as to when or if they're going to join the party. Anything else you should know? Um, well, yeah, one, one thing I want to also talk about is it's called WebSockets. Um, so this brings network I.O. so you can do multiplayer games. You could do, you know, just a two-player game or massively, even a massively multiplayer game uh, through your browser. Uh, this is a low-level network I.O. You, you can create sockets and talk whatever protocol you want. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because in the, on the server side, you have to have, like, this gateway that, uh, like, the, the server has to talk web web sockets, like the connection has to be specific, but then you can do whatever you want once you've done the handshake. Um, and you can do that, you can use the, the web sockets in Safari, you can use them in Chrome. They actually do work in iOS, which is pretty neat. Um, 
And Firefox supported them and then stopped supporting them because of security problems. Apparently they're really nervous about some security issues with uh, having browsers being able to open socket connections. Um, but they're going to, they, apparently they've worked it out and they're going to re-enable support shortly. Um, uh, no love in Internet Explorer. Actually, yes, there is. Up here. Internet Explorer has a website? Um, there is, you can download a plugin that Microsoft has put out. There, it's, it's their out of band that they're working on for IE 10. It's actually been out for IE 9 since the IE 9 RC came out. Okay. Um, I think it's HTML5labs.com or something like yeah. that. Microsoft also ha they have a couple other HTML5 plugins that you can download for IE 9 to get kind of beta level support for some of the things they're working on for 10. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, and I, there's also a, a flash shim for this. You can go to like, you can, if you Google like socket.io or something, there's basically this thing you can drop in that does web sockets if they're supported or bridges everything through flash, which can create sockets otherwise. Um, so you can actually kind of do network IO and JavaScript uh, pretty reliably. There's this website called caniuse.com, which is really neat. You can just type in any technology related that you want into it and it'll tell you full spread of what browsers support it, when it, you know, how long they've supported it and all of that. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, one kind of closing thought I want to add is that, um, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, there's like some games where you would maybe not be able to release them today and get the performance that you want, but considering the browser vendors have been, you know, ramping up the speed of, of their implementations by like, sometimes 100% in six months. It's like, if you have a six month or 18 month dev cycle, all of a sudden JavaScript becomes a hell of a lot more compelling as a language to make a game in. Um, because there's a lot of opportunity to, to produce stuff very rapidly because it's a higher level language. And you can also target multiple platforms. Um, you know, which you can, I guess you can do with other tools. You can do it uh, with Unity to an extent and you can, you know, supposedly do it with Java, although I always hear that there's, there's more myth to that than truth from some people, but I, I don't know, not a Java person. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, I'm pretty impressed with where it's at now, and, and I really, I think it's only gonna get better and better. Yeah. Um, yeah, there we go. I got two things I wanted to touch on. Um, SVG. Yeah. Have you looked at that at all? You probably tell people what that is. Yeah, sure. And then the other thing is IP protection, intellectual property. All yes. this, it's JavaScript. Great question. Your browser downloads it, people can debug it uh -huh. and step into your code. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> the IP protection one is, is nasty because, uh, I mean, you can op obfuscate, you can run it through like Google Closure and it will mangle it, but at the end of the day, um, you know, somebody's still got something that's code and not you know, it's not even byte code, it's code. Um, they can try and demangle it and they'll have, they'll have quite a bit of your IP. Um, the other place where that really gets to be a pain is with like high score tables. Just like, with like high score tables because, um, you know, you, you want to be able to talk to a server and say like, you know, I got this score in the game, but you can't trust the client, plus people can manipulate the client, you know? So it's like you're, you're always trying to stay a step ahead of people who are going to take the time to look and see how the high score mechanism works and put in their own scores and stuff. And, and honestly, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, anytime you can like see the the network traffic, you have an opportunity there. But I mean, with with JavaScript, it's like unless you're going to like implement like public private key encryption and like JavaScript or something. I don't. There's nothing you can really do. You know, like you'd have to. Yeah. It's, so it's like. There's, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, the, the only thing you could ever do if you really wanted to, like, stop any sort of, like, score cheating or any of that stuff is you'd have to constantly be hitting a remote server with everything that the user is doing so that the, the server is keeping an instance of the game so that if all of a sudden, you know, the, the player says they killed ten enemies and they're, you know, but that those events never happened and they don't check out on the server side. But, I mean, that'd be crazy. You'd be running an instance of the game server. It'd never scale. So... You know, it's, uh, I don't know, like, I don't know what that means, you know, for the, I mean, if you package something as a native app, then uh, people have to, like, decompile to get code, um, and supposedly there's some ways to, to kind of mitigate that, but if you're publishing in the web, then people really do have pretty, uh, 
It's a big question that yeah. the browser vendors need to figure out or the HTML group needs yeah. to figure out because that is going to be a, a major deterrent for commercial gaming. Yeah, probably. Probably will. <laughs> I forgot, there, there's a first part of your question, I forgot. SVG. Yeah, so SVG is, is scalable vector graphics. Um, and you, you can do, I mean, just like you can do a game with HTML and CSS or you can do a game with Canvas, you can do a game with SVG and then you have a, a vector-based game, which is kind of neat. Um, I haven't seen a ton of people doing games in SVG, though. I've seen a few, but not, I think it's just marketing more than anything. I think there's so much marketing behind HTML5 and Canvas that that's yeah. where all of the development's happening. Yeah, the some of the advantages I've seen in SVG is it is vector, mm -hmm. so supporting the multiple devices can, becomes much easier. And it does have JavaScript interfaces for it, and right. it's very flexible. Yeah. You can change things on the fly within it. Yeah. Um, there's a SVG Girl um, cartoon anime demo yeah. that yeah. was done all in SVG, and you can go and change the colors and have it rerun. It was extremely impressive how much they had running on the screen. and. I just, I was just wondering if you'd looked at using that for anything or yeah. seeing any other games that have used it. And I know like SVG has like within the language spec it has events and animations and stuff so you can like have an SVG sprite that inside of the sprite itself it knows how to animate itself and it like gets kind of offloaded to the browser and you don't have to think about it. So there's some kind of neat aspects to SVG for sure. Um, but I, I just don't have that much experience with it myself. You've been waiting patiently. As far as like I yeah. Um, I mean, they do have like your JavaScript and you do minify it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so you know, all the very are done. Yeah. If you've ever used a decompiler, they work really well. Sure. Like basically, you have all the methods. Like, <coughs> well, Flash too. I mean, you can you can reverse uh, decompile right. Flash pretty effectively. Yeah. The only thing you don't really get is local variable names. Yeah. It's pretty easy to figure out how some of this code works. Right. And that's why I say that it's only probably going to affect commercial. I mean, I think some of the big studios will probably be scared off, but if there's money in it, if people are making money, they're they're going to keep developing. You know, and it's like you even if you even if everyone can see your code, you still own the graphics, you still own the sound, you still own all the levels that you've designed, and it's like people are going to rip off your game regardless if it's a good idea. So, and they can't use your code verbatim because then that would be uh, copyright infringement. So like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, you give them a leg up, but they're gonna copy you if you have a good game anyway. Well, I, I think some of the other things against that is the ease of entry for hacking a game is so much, it, it's right there in the browser, you can just debug it. Compared to the other things, you do have to go and run other things, so script kiddies could come back. Yeah. And also then people can like make these extensions for the browsers to hack your game and mm -hmm. fun stuff like that. So it gets to be extremely, it gets to be, you have to put more time into trying to fight the people trying to game your system because it becomes so much easier for them to do that. So yeah. I, I think that, I, I really hope for some sort of packaging system that can help it to be secure within the browser system. Yeah, I mean it, it makes sense to an extent. They're already doing like just-in-time compiling, so why not do that ahead of time? And then you've got bytecode, and it's at least a little bit more of like a step for people who want to steal your code. But I don't know. I don't know if, especially with Google doing like the web store, there might be incentive for them to do some sort of compiled format or something for those. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Although again, they can pile the format. It's going to have all the important names yeah. and the code still there, and any bytes code can easily yeah. you know, yeah. put back in yeah. pieces a lot more. I think the point he's making is you, you, know, you can just get on the console right now and just like, you know, start tweaking the values inside of variables in real time and stuff like that. Be like, score equals one million. You know, like, you can totally do that. I mean, you can you you wrap all your code in a lambda function, and then it's no longer in a global scope, and makes it a little bit harder because then you actually have to use a debugger and like put in like you know breakpoint and then change the values because you can't just go on the console and say score equals whatever. But 
if, if someone knows what they're doing, they can really mess with your, your JavaScript game a lot, you know. But I don't know if it's a bad thing. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's flattering. If people want to take the time to reverse engineer your, your obfuscated code and, like, make some things, I mean, it could be free press for your game, you know. It's like, it's only when it stops making it fun that it really, if it's multiplayer and someone's, you know, taking the fun out of it by some nasty cheat, then it's like, what do you do? But um, I do have uh, another, one other demo here. So uh, something to take with you in your HTML5 game making quest. So um, are you guys familiar with uh, Ludum Dare? Yeah, it's a 24-hour game making challenge. So I, I did that. I did Ludum Dare 20, and I made a game uh, with HTML5 for that. And I just wanted to share it. Like four times a year or something like that now. Yeah. And they, and they do mini dares now, which are like 24 hour things that don't have as much of a, you know, press thing around them and stuff like that. All right. So I use Aki Havara for this again. So the theme was it's dangerous to go along, take this, was the actual the theme for Ludum Dare. So I made like a, a really old school like puzzle game. Like the graphics are almost like uh, ZX Spectrum or something like that. Um, so you've got your little link guy and this kitten. So I, I actually combined the, the It's Dangerous to Go Alone from Zelda 1 with the meme from the internet where the guy's got a kitten that he's given to you. So I put those two together. And then uh, It's Dangerous to Go Alone in quotes. So you've got your guy and there's a toilet and toilet paper. And then you've got your kitten and there's a bag of litter and a litter box. So you've got to kind of, you have to navigate these two together. So you've got to like go here and pick up your pick up your toilet paper and your litter, and then you have to get the cat into the cat box and you into the the toilet. <laughs> and then it gets harder. So now there's like lava, right? So you gotta and you have to mind what the cat's doing while you're doing your thing, so you don't steer the cat into the lava kind of thing. And they get. Uh, Progressively harder. Yeah. Even more lava. Oh, I just, I, man, this is my own game and I just screwed myself. Watch what's going to happen here. All right, so I'm going to try and get over there without killing my, oh, man. <laughs> it's been a while since I played. All right. So, I'm going to get over there, but I hose myself because I, uh, I got the toilet paper first, so now I can't get the litter. So now i got to drive the kitten to the lava. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, this is the, the basic, uh, basic idea. So I've got to get this first, and now I can, I can steer my kitten over here. And I can go and get this. And, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. All right. Well, let's... Uh, that's nice, my slides anywhere, but I'm happy to talk more or answer questions or, or whatever. Can you talk a little bit about how you handle time and all of these things, mm -hmm. so like animations and yeah. you know, things happening, and you, you mm -hmm. set time out for smarter? Yeah, well, there is something smarter now, so, um, but of course it's not supported by every browser. So the typical way to do it is you either set an interval or you, or you um, so you can set an er interval and say every, uh, you know, 60 times a second run my draw function. Um, or you can do it the other way where you, um, you, you have two things going on. Where you have one, you have like a, a time fixed loop where it, it calculates how much time has gone since the last one and runs as many iterations of your, your collision and all that stuff to update the game and, and then draw a frame. Um, and then now there's this thing called uh, like animation frame ready or something like that. It's, a, it's an event that the browser generates and uh, Firefox and, and Safari and Chrome do it. Um, and basically the, the, every time the browser is going to paint, 
it uh, sends you this event, um, and you put your all your draw code in there. So you have, you know, your, you know, basically uh, every time you get one of those I can draw events, you see how much time has passed, and you you update all of your objects as many times as they need to be updated, and and then you draw your frame. Um, and you're supposed to get it 60 times a second. Um, if you're doing a ton of crazy stuff in your game, you might only be able to draw, you know, 30 times a second. If your game is really simple, uh, you know, you might be drawing 120 frames a second. Um, and it's it's also it won't it won't send the events if you're in a different tab or you know the browser is minimized or something like that, which is uh, like on a laptop really nice because you know you might have a game running in the background that doesn't seem like it's doing anything but it's painting the guy standing there 60 times a second and, and chewing up battery but with this animation frame is ready thing you can be in a different tab and that just shuts down all the painting. Um, and so that's kind of why you need to pay attention to how much time has elapsed because you might need to move a bunch of stuff when there's been 10 seconds that have gone by that it hasn't painted or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Using, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you can you can certainly just look for a, a, a blur, a window blur event, which you'll, you'll fire if you switch out of a tab or or out of a window. Um, you can f and then you can just have some state variable that says I'm paused or whatever, and and throttle down your drawing yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in each each one of these engines some of them like handle some of this stuff for you and you know some offer you more tools than others you know they each kind of have their own approach to handling user inputs and draw loops and all these things um, you know so sometimes you have a bunch of nice functions out of the box that take care of this stuff for you and otherwise you're you know having to implement all that stuff yourself yeah you mentioned uh, titanium foam yeah Do mm -hmm. you see that kind of moving forward or like going away if you can, you know, compared to, you know, tapping into the actual native features on the phone? Like, mm -hmm. Do you think those kind of technologies are going to get better or kind of fizzle away? I think they'll get better. I think, I think JavaScript's here to stay. I, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if. I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical, but part of me really thinks that Apple's going to cave and just let people. Use JavaScript to write native apps out of the box. Um, you already can. It's really easy. Right. Right. But but if you want to, from within that web view, if you want to um, check what the gyroscope is doing or uh, fire up something from the iPod or whatever, you have to bridge the from the JavaScript to the native app and then write all those native functions. What Titanium and PhoneGap do is they have these native. Uh, they expose all the native APIs in JavaScript. And actually, with uh, with PhoneGap, you do everything inside of your web view code. So, like, you write your game, and inside your your game JavaScript that's manipulating an HTML5 canvas, you'll have some, you know, like PhoneGap dot get me the gyroscope or whatever. But with with Titanium, they they've separated it. So you write your your native kind of application code in JavaScript in one file, and then if you want to render stuff into a browser view, you Create a browser view and then load in different JavaScript into that, and they're and they're so that way. What they're basically doing is they're having um, more access to like native UI elements and stuff, but with like JavaScript. Like you can create like a native table view or a native camera view or some of these. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They basically like. Yeah. So uh, we're all thinking. Our company's been doing a bunch of mobile stuff lately, so we're actually using Titanium and Phone Gap. Cool. And we tried them for a little while and got frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get frustrated with Titanium all the time because there's like, uh, the, oh well, I just, the, the documentation for it drives me crazy, but. But uh, Phone Gap's pretty neat. Like, I've, I've run into walls with, with uh, Titanium before. Where it was too much of a pain to, to like recompile Titanium to fix their bugs. Whereas with PhoneGap, it's creating like a. It's so easy because it creates um, an Xcode uh, project, and you can see the PhoneCap 
a PhoneGap Objective C. So like if something's not working with PhoneGap, you can just tweak the Objective C and you know. But then you're starting to get to the point where it's like, well, why didn't I just write the whole thing in Objective C then? <laughs> you know. But but you know, it, it's sometimes it's so fast to, to kick something out in JavaScript, especially if you have come from a web development background and you're already familiar with using this stuff. You can you can kick out a game really quickly. Um, you know, and as long as you're not trying to to you know make Battlefield Earth or something in JavaScript, you, you know, you can make a lot of games and they'll perform just fine. Um, and you can and you can produce them pretty quickly. Although I, I know plenty of people who are, will actually like use something like Titanium or Impact to just prototype their game and do like a lot of play testing and kind of get some of their ideas fleshed out because it's so quick to iterate. And then they'll like go to Cocos 2D or something to do the final product. It's like they consider it like a you know, play test, and then they go into real development. But I don't know. I mean, to, to answer the original question, I think that Titanium and PhoneGap and NimbleKit and all these tools will continue to evolve um, and try and mitigate whatever slowdown they have from being abstracted away from Objective-C as much as they can. I know t Titanium is moving more and more towards letting you uh, open up the project in Xcode and and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know if they're actually thinking about compiling the JavaScript to Objective-C. I mean, right now it's all interpreted, but um, I don't know. I think JavaScript's uh, the language to know right now, honestly. I, I, I don't know. I mean, any of the, like, the Unity folks or some of the rest of you know, I, I, a lot of these engines, like you, you can do a lot of scripting in Python. I don't know if you can also, I think there's like a JavaScript dialect of some sort for Unity also. Yeah? Yeah. But it's definitely not JavaScript. Not JavaScript, okay. You mean, like, mostly interesting function or functionality you can do in JavaScript, like anonymous functions? Yeah. It's not. Okay. neat language. I mean, it's come a long way since like, you know, Netscape 3 and so, I mean, the, the biggest difference in JavaScript now from back then is that a, a lot of the headaches with, with cross-browser compatibility are, you know, shrinking. You know, like you can write JavaScript and it'll work in every browser without any problems these days. You don't have to have like all of these, if I e do this, like JavaScript's gotten pretty good. Now, when JavaScript's talking to HTML or CSS or something, then you've got a problem. But the, the core JavaScript language has gotten pretty standardized. Have you looked at CopyScript at all? You know, uh, I'm familiar with it. Um, is that's um, the one that you go from Java to JavaScript, right? The, yeah, no, it's, it's, I was thinking it's, Google's product then. No, it's, uh, I recommend it. I okay. Okay. Coffee script, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, sorry, I, I, I thought you said something else because I always just think e ECMA or whatever. I never pronounce it, but yeah, yeah, the new, yeah, the 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 language spec that both ActionScript and JavaScript have kind of forked from. Yeah, because uh, yeah, ActionScript was what they were going to make ECMAScript for, mm -hmm. I believe, and yeah. then it was dissolved. But yeah, ECMAScript five is looking pretty nice. Um, I I nine has good support. Uh, uh, most of the WebKit browsers do. I think Opera has decent support for it. There have been a couple ECMA 5 only games shown off, but you get nice things like script mode, you get better um, scoping, and it's you, you can get a much more um, uh, much more terse language out of it. But do you know if they you have to um, watch out for older browsers, because yeah. so, none of them like I. Uh, 
uh, Firefox 3.5 has some issues with it, and IE 7 and 8 don't have any support at all. Yeah. Do you know about any uh, performance differences with with 5? Have they like are they able to do funky optimizations with that language that they can't do with? Yeah, I think in strict mode, um, they're able to do much more. Um, optimizations on it hmm. because it gets rid of some of the the funky valuations that they have to work around. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, it'll be interesting. There was a. Does it have stronger types? A Do bit you know? stronger. Yeah. yeah. You can make you can make types um, sealed if you want to. You can freeze them. Um, John Resig has a couple good posts. Cool. On ECMA five. Um, so. Yeah. Getters and setters. Pr actual properties. Yeah. Um. Uh, there was an interesting demo someone put up, I think it was last week, of JSIL. It's a, it's a .NET to JavaScript compiler. They took one of the XNA platforming demos. They just downloaded, downloaded the demo from the, the creator forum or the site and cross-compiled it, threw it into um, in Canvas and using ECMAScript 5, and it ran rather well. I had a, a friend run it on his iPad, and it ran. It was pretty nice. Huh. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you. You're welcome.